Hi, I'm Mike Penninger. I'm the chairman of the Head and Neck Institute in Cleveland at the Cleveland Clinic. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about vocafold injection. And I think we should start with why do we bother? I mean, why do we do vocafold injections? And, and the clear answer, or the easy answer, is that what we want to do is we want to add bulk to the vocafold or we want to push the vocafold. And injectables give us that capability. The real underlying issues are much more subtle. It's when do you inject? What do you inject? Uh, who do you inject? Timing of injection. So all of those become very important in relationship to injection for vocal folds. Um, I'm going to break these out into two separate categories. The one category is vocal fold bulk. Um, that's primarily in patients who have either a scarred vocal fold, have had prior surgery on their vocal fold, or have an aging larynx and presbylaryngeas and vocal fold bowing. The indications for doing an injectable for that are multiple, and the location for doing injectables are also multiple. Some of the things you would think about is how badly do they need their voice and when? Um, do you want to do something on a trial basis to see, for example, if we were going to do something more permanently, could we estimate what the results are by doing a temporary injectable? I think the advent of office-based surgery, particularly office-based injections, have completely changed the paradigm. In the past, we would be cautious about doing vocal fold injection unless it was absolutely necessary if we had to take a patient to the operating room in order to do that. Now we actually use it on a trial uh, basis. The other advantage we have now is that we have injectables that are much more flexible in their use. Um, in the old days, which many people don't remember, when we really only had gel foam, which went away very quickly, or Teflon, which lasted forever, but often left with vocal fold granulomas, we didn't have a lot of options. <clears throat> now we have multiple options for injections. In the office basis, you have something like gel foam, which most people really don't use much now. Most people are actually using hyaluronic acid. The beauty of hyaluronic acid is it gives you a temporary effect that'll last anywhere from three weeks to six, eight, 12 weeks. And in the data we had for vocal fold paralysis for injection, um, we actually showed that the, the average length of the time was almost three months. So it gives you a fairly good result. Then you actually have longer lasting injectables. Um, formerly called RADIUS, which can last anywhere from 9 to 12 months. Um, and some people will actually inject fat in the office. So that becomes a little bit more complicated to in order to harvest the fat. How are you going to do it? How are you going to process it? It takes a lot longer. So anyway, for vocal fold bowing, I use injectables um, both temporarily. So I'll inject a little hyaluronic acid in the office, see what kind of voice results they get. And then if they have a good voice result and that goes away, then we can plan our long-term therapy. We know that bulking up the vocal folds are going to make a difference. Similar thing with scar. Oftentimes with scar, what you're unclear of, is the scar the real problem or is it the loss of mass the real problem? If you inject temporarily, you can determine if it's a mass effect. And then the third group is sulcus patients. So sulcus patients clearly have both loss of bulk and they have decreased vibratory margin and basically scarring. And so a temporary injection in the office gives you a clue as to whether or not a more permanent injection can work in the operating room. These principles are the same if you're doing it for bowing or for vocal fold paralysis. I think vocal fold paralysis gives you a little bit more dynamics because you have to make a bigger closure, um, where with bowing you just want to get the two vocal folds to get together. If I actually have a successful temporary injection in the office, it really lets me know whether or not I will have a successful, more formal operative procedure in the operating room. In the operating room, I tend to use primarily fat. And the reason I like fat is that it has the viscoelastic properties of normal vocal fold. Uh, and there's a potential that could be permanent. And similarly, we studied this. And about 50% of people that you inject fat in get a long-term result. And there's now some evidence that there may, in fact, be stem cells in fat. So it integrates into the normal laryngeal tissue. Um, however, the vocal fold injection in the office may also tell you you need a lot to put in. And then, for example, for Boeing, you may bring them into the operating room. And you may want to do bilateral medializations, for example. <clears throat> 
Focal fold paralysis is a little bit different dynamic, although the principles of the injection is the same. Uh, with focal fold paralysis, we tend to inject people as soon as we see them. If, they're, if they have a hoarse voice, we just inject them in the office. And we can do that in two different ways. Um, I can either do it by myself with the patient holding their own tongue with a rigid scope and a curved needle and inject in the office. Um, or you could do it with another pair of hands where you use a flexible scope through the nose, look at the larynx, and then you can hold the patient's tongue and you can use an, a long-term injection needle. You can also go through the thyrohyoid space. Um, it's a nice uh, way to do it. It also gives you the flexibility of potentially doing it by yourself. I avoid doing that if I have anybody that's on Coumadin or on blood thinners. I've had a couple of hematomas through the, the thyrohyoid space. I've never really had a bad outcome for patients when I inject them in the office, um, even it, on Coumadin if I inject them transorally. So I tend to do a little bit more transoral injection and only in people that have a strong gag or don't tolerate going through the mouth well do I do a trans thyrohyoid injection. Um, again, what do you inject? Well, initially, I like to, again, inject with hyaluronic acid. Those patients are coming in. We don't know what results they're going to have. We don't know if that vocal fold is going to recover. So to inject a temporary filler such as hyaluronic acid gives you the flexibility of time. Gets them back to work, gets them swallowing better, gets their voices stronger. Um, quality of life, outcomes are better, and there's actually some data that suggests that early office injections on patients with vocal fold paralysis may actually prevent long-term sequelae and prevent the need for them to actually have to go on to a more permanent procedure. Still debated, but in our practice we have actually shown that to be the case. The other nice thing with hyaluronic acid is if you stay relatively if you get a little bit superficial where you don't necessarily want to be, you want that injection to be as lateral as you can in the vocal fold in most instances, if you just get them to phonate for five or ten minutes in the office, it remodels and it'll flatten out nicely. So I usually inject them um, anywhere from 0.5 to 0.9 ml. Um, I go ahead and let them go ahead and speak and, and we have them read. And then I come back in five minutes later if they have a good result, we send them home. If they don't have a good result, we inject a little bit more. So there are these other potential options. And then, you can, and then you can make a decision about whether or not you want to do them in the operating room. And again, if I'm going to do an injection in the operating room, my go-to is fat. I know that some people are using silicone, injectable silicone. I would recommend against that. I've seen a number of complications with that. If you get it in the wrong place, um, then it's forever and you would actually have to surgically remove it if you needed to. So that was the, the problem with those kind of permanent injectables is unless you get a perfect injection, you don't really have an opportunity to modify it. Where if you were doing a medialization or a retinoid adduction or even a re you have an opportunity to modify that if you needed to either at that time or down the road. So people ask me, how do you process the fat? So if you were going to inject fat in the operating room, then what I like to do is I like to take open incision and a large piece of fat, take out the large fat lobules and pull away all the connective tissue in between, rinse away any blood, dry it, put it in an old Bruning syringe. A Bruning syringe was what we used to inject Teflon with. Um, in the operating room, patient apneic, no tube in place, um, or with the tube in place, either way, you have to inject too much because we know that anywhere between, oh, 65% to 85% of the fat will resorb. So you want to overcorrect it. If you do have a tube in, I would recommend that you deflate the tube completely, pull it out under direct visualization so you don't push any of the fat out of that small needle hole going forward. So the bottom line is, is that injectables gives us a lot of flexibility. And I think that the office, uh, approach to managing patients with injections allows us to give them an immediate result, simple procedure. They can drive themselves in, drive themselves, uh, themselves home, so it doesn't require anybody to be with them. Uh, it'll last anywhere, depending on what you inject, from six weeks to nine to 12 months. Um, and it gives you the flexibility of then deciding if you want to re-inject or if you want to come back and do something more permanent.